very heartwarming to be back in Jekyll Ward. Um, I have very special memories of this place. A lot of who I am today was shaped here. And I do greatly thank God for each and every single one of us who has this great privilege to be part of such a wonderful family of Christians and to participate in what God is doing on this campus and in your individual lives um, this far. So, <clears throat> may the Lord bless you for coming for this Friday fellowship and, and I pray that he speaks to us and refreshes us tonight. Oh, Wednesday. <laughs> I'm used to many of the CEOs do, uh, do, do have their fellowships on Friday, so I'm being carried away by what I'm commonly used to. How can I forget that I used to do a fellowship on Wednesdays? Um, I was excited to hear that Powerhouse has light. <laughs> because, oh man, I enjoyed being in the powerhouse. There used to be a certain corner that I would kneel and cry and pray. And, and I just thank God. I, I spoke so many things about my marriage in that powerhouse, my career, uh, my children. And just to see some of them coming to pass is really, really refreshing. So please, spare time for the powerhouse. Amen? Amen. And if they still the upper chambers, is it, is it still there? So go to the powerhouse, get power, and then finish in the upper chambers to tear the devil's kingdom down. <laughs> so that you enjoy the power of experiencing God's goodness in your life. I came with a colleague, uh, Sam. Some of you would want to come and just say hello in a minute. <coughs> Sam is uh, our staff in charge of uh, literature. Um, he's, uh, uh, I need to treat him tenderly because he's getting married in a very few weeks. <laughs> so, so Sam, uh, please greet the brethren. I hope this is tender enough. <laughs> Good evening and praise the Lord. I'm happy to be here. It's my first time to join you in your Wednesday service. Yes, I'm a graduate of Chuka University. I graduated 10 years after our speaker. <laughs> Yes, I did become and I am born again. I'm happy to be here. I pray that the Lord will speak to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I did a motion a couple of hours ago and asked him to give me company and he was gracious to do so. And thank you, brother, for bringing me along. I've really been blessed by the worship team is well, wait on God in his presence, celebrate Jesus. I just wish it would go on and on and on. Beautiful messages of God's goodness and grace in our midst. <clears throat> One of the things that I have a great interest in is preaching. And so I read a bit about preaching, and one of those leads that I remember is an idea that when you go in any place to preach, dress in such a way that people will not remember how you are dressed a couple of days after the sermon. <laughs> so I hope you won't remember how I was dressed tonight. <laughs> But that's modesty. And this is how many people tend to think about the subject of modesty, dressing, and particularly with reference to our sisters. 
You know, when we were students here and we wanted to suggest that our good sister has not dressed very well, we were very respectful and honorable. We used to tell her, sister, today you have dressed very uniquely. <laughs> I even heard a preacher one day say that one of the greatest constant battle for men is purity, but that for women is modesty. Hey, but modesty isn't just about dressing, neither is it just about women. Both men and women are invited to cultivate this critical and important virtue called modesty. By English definition, modesty would be considered as the quality of being rel relatively moderate in amount, rate, or level, or the quality of talking about, or not, sorry, the quality of not talking about, or not trying to make people notice your abilities or achievements. Now, this is complicated in a social media field world, and, and there's value for that. It's also the quality or state of being unassuming in the estimation of your abilities. Perhaps a simple way to put it is the quality of avoiding excesses and extremes. And this, this, I find this very challenging and, and rather stretching in an environment that measures sometimes, not always, but tends to measure our worth sometimes by the number of likes in our postings, or a context that tends to put lots of significance on the impressions people make, whether than who they truly are, um, in an environment where people tend to display their tests, acquisitions, achievements, and they would not mind to have many people get to know who they are, what they have done, and what they own. Often, this is driven by a couple of factors like pressure to always present the best of us. Haven't you been in trainings? Elders in the house, or should I say house? We used to have a city chairman who would say, Elders in the house! <laughs> so, you're an elder and you are thinking about a job, and all you're told is go up there and give the best of you. Present the best of you so much so that sometimes we are pushed to exaggerate or even lie about what we have done, achieved, or I am even capable of doing. The desire to be noticed, accepted, affirmed, appreciated, sometimes pushes us to stretch beyond what is normal, moderate, to excesses that can be tricky and dangerous, or even the fear of missing out. They call it FOMO. And against our convictions, against our preferences, against our sometimes even passions, in the quest to display our best, sometimes we just want not to be left out. And so get into this world that constantly pushes us to present more than what there truly is. To be just a little dishonest, to be just a little excessive in doing things. And whereas there's a place for presentation of the perfect you, the great you, the best of you, whereas there's a place for owning great things and wonderful things and making great achievements and speaking about them, there always lies the risk and the danger of going to excesses and extremes and indulging rather too much. This is what characterized the women in the Bible world of Ephesus. 
But Paul writes to a passage that I will read briefly, just two verses, three, but focus on one verse. Uh, you well know that um, it's not our culture in focus to preach on one verse, but, but I will constantly put this within its context to give it its meaning. But First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, if you turn with me there, or if you swipe with me there, because I suspect most of us would rather be swiping than turning, says in verse 8 of chapter 2, 1 Timothy, Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want, verse 9, the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, this, this, this instruction to women is rather excessive. How do you dress in good deeds? Is Paul against beautiful ornaments? I mean, let's be honest. When we are preparing to go for a journey, and my wife is getting herself ready, of course, all the time she's let. <laughs> Later than me, not let for the time of going, later than I finish. I just do what I must do quickly, three, four, five minutes, I'm set. And she takes her time. And, 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 and I have come to appreciate that time because when she walks out of that room, I, I look at her and I appreciate the decision I made. <laughs> <laughs> In elaborate hairstyles, in gold and pearls, and in expensive clothes. You know, when I was getting married to her, I told her, I will ensure you experience and enjoy your test of cloth, food, and housing. <laughs> so she still reminds me that uh, I'm not fully. But so that we don't get dissuaded into other matters that are not the subject of our debate today, or our sermon today, the question here then is that Paul doesn't, Paul isn't telling women not to dress up beautifully, or not to put on hairstyles that are attractive. Neither does he want them not to put on expensive clothes. On the surface, Paul's message would sound like a simple message of, hey, turn down. However, I think that this passage presents some profound principles on the subject of modesty, and I beg that you indulge me to share a few with you in this sermon um, briefly. But just some two things that pick up, then I'll pick four things that I will dwell on for my share. First of all, Paul seems to say godly character and good works are better ornaments. I'm still struggling as I dealt with this text and I haven't resolved why Paul takes the comparison of some inner qualities with outer ornaments. So he says, character and good works are better ornaments, they are better clothing, they are better dressing than elaborate hairstyles, expensive jewelry and clothes. In other words, true self-worth, true sense of, of who we are is in our character rather than it is in the outward expressions. That would either be reputation or clothing or whatever else that would be. But it also says that they that profess godliness of the house of God, in their dress as well as in every other area of their life, need to act in a way that demonstrates modesty, decency, and propriety that calls for three things that I would suggest self-effacement, which is humility, self-control, and simplicity. 
So I'm going to share three principles from this text, four, sorry, and then we will try this up. Number one is that modesty, for modesty to be achieved, you need to have a right sense of self-worth as foundation. A right sense of self-worth. Number two is that you need self-effacement or humility as an essential prerequisite. Number three is that you need to exercise self-control to be consistently modest. And number three, we need to embrace simplicity as a necessary virtue. So self-worth, right sense of self-worth, the prerequisite of humility or self-effacement, the virtue of self-control, and the virtue of simplicity. How do these four express themselves in these texts and in our application? A right sense of self-worth is what we begin with. The rich men, women in Ephesus, the church to which Paul addresses this letter, particularly Timothy, who is the leader of this church, seemed to declare their high status, their value, their identity, with their high, the level of expenditure, or how expensive what they put on was. When he talks about gold, power, expensive clothes, this is high and dressing. And it does look like they drew their self-worth, their value, their identity in these things. Paul's response in the letter to Timothy therefore points out that to the fact that modesty or lack of it reveals something of our sense of identity or self-worth. He therefore challenges these women to view, to have this human view of self-worth that was defi being defined by how they dressed, if it was in our time, the cars they arrived with. Those of you who are a little older will remember a famous lady in this country who was known for how she dressed. I want to suspect that this is the way these women dressed. You will remember the lady of Gusto Umf, what was the other names she used to use? But the, her name was Oreo Rogo Manduli. She was once the Miss Kenya in I think 70s. And in her old age, she used to put on in one characteristic way, elegance, pricey, class. And when she arrived and showed up, you knew Oreo had arrived. This was the character of the people Paul is addressing. They seem to dress excessively that people will remember years after how they were dressed <laughs> on the day they preached in JK Watt. I remember well a couple of years ago when I was appointed as the CU chairperson on my first introductory Sunday, I was in a yellow coat. <laughs> I look with those photos with admiration and I laugh. But every so often I meet my friends that we were together here those days. They say, hey, pastor, with a yellow coat. <laughs> They seemed to address in a way that attracted attention to themselves rather than to who they truly were. I am almost tempted to think that they really wanted to be recognized. Romans 12 verse 3 implores us to evaluate ourselves properly with sober judgment a call to introspection to focus on our inner state of heart, the purity of our motives and attitudes, and the excellency of our works. And Paul seems to tell these women, or to tell Timothy, hey, address this question in church because there are excesses that tend to be moving people away from what really matters. 
God and Christ. And so aware of your value in God, or our value in God, and thus our status before him, the exercise of proper judgment, as Paul would write in Romans, is meant to help us draw attention around us to the right things. It is therefore essential to have a right sense of self-worth, your value in God, so that you are not struggling to do anything in excess to make yourself noticed. And in that sense, a right sense of your self-worth helps you to practice modesty. In the words of A.W. Tozer, in an attempt to explain the self-worth of those of us in Christ, he will say, when the Lord lays his hand upon a man, that man ceases at once to be ordinary. He immediately becomes extraordinary. And his life takes on cosmic significance. Those are powerful words, extraordinary cosmic significance. The angels in heaven take notice of him and go forth to become his ministers. And if you are born again, is this, is this making you begin to feel something inside that is so nice that you need nothing else but this identity to make you exercise all the self-control, the modesty, the simplicity required? And he goes on to say, though the man had been only one of the faceless multitudes on earth, a mere seafar in the universe, an invisible dust grain blown across endless wastes. Now he gets a face and a name and a place in the scheme of meaningful things. Christ knows his own ship by name. They are known, there are no unknown Christians, no insignificant sons of God. Each one signifies, each is a sign drawing attention to the triune God day and night upon him. The faceless man has a face, the nameless has a name, when Jesus picks him out of the multitude and calls him to himself. When we have Christ in us, and he becomes our primary identity marker, then we need not to do anything in excess to exert ourselves and impress, make impressions. And so as Christians, our self-worth and esteem rises by having a right relationship with God. We can know we are valuable because of the high price God paid for us through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. We need not therefore to do anything to prove any point but live to honor him who died for us to give us imperishable life. The story is told of a great professor who was in a church serving in a fairly what would be considered mundane, dirty, and an, uh, work that does not have reputation. And so someone went to him and said, how can you, a professor, be belittling yourself like this? Now, you guys are living in days when my people I graduated with are already professors. And one of the people that we did graduate with, he did his doctorate about four years after we finished graduated. He did his master's in one and a half years, did his PhD in two and a half years. He's written a couple of papers. He's soon becoming an associate professor on this campus, a wonderful friend of mine. We take, up, we take coffee a couple of times, but do I say? <laughs> <laughs> That's on a light note. But you know, when this professor was being talked to, they were numbered. It reminds me again of one time we were doing first year orientation and the first year came on this pulpit and said, my name is, you know, so and so. And he says, do you know engineer so and so? We said, of course we don't, we didn't know him. Have you heard of professor so and so? Then we say, that sounds a little familiar. Do you know professor so and so? And then he says, those are my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> but the next of the professors he was mentioning were guys who lived in the days when being a professor was a prof. So this prof was challenged not to do this stuff and to let his name become a, an essence of identity and, 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 and prestige and, and pride to which the professor returned the response. 
The dignity of a man's service is not in the work he does, but in the master he serves. He says, my master is so dignified, I will do anything for him. Our master, our Lord, is so dignified that modesty should be so naturally expressed out of us. And the reason is not because we need not to do the best, but rather, we don't need to do anything extra to make ourselves better. He is enough for us and in us. In any case, nothing we do qualifies or measures up to anything. The best of our works, the best of our clothes, the best of our summons, the best of our grades amount to nothing before him. They are actually but filthy rags. But his righteousness, the beauty of character, is what matters the most. And so Paul says, tell them to exercise modesty not by dressing in elegance and expensive things, or not by displaying what they have achieved for everyone to see, but let their character speak for them. Let their virtues speak for them. Let their convictions, works of faith, speak for them. That's the nature of Christ's people. Our sense of self-worth is so critical in defining and empowering us to live lives of modesty. We exercise ability for restraint. We have no business showing anyone anything we have. Haven't you seen people who, when they have some nice, good phone, always on the desk, wait until the screen cracks, then they turn it around, and before long, the cover is old and it remains in the pocket. Put that phone on whether the cover is torn or the screen is cracked, because it doesn't define you. <laughs> Modesty is practiced when we have the ability to sense and recognize that whether this someone works or not, that's not who I am. The Christ is me, is who I am. So I will do nothing to impress you in this sermon. Nothing in excess. I'll just be faithfully try to deliver what I have. What I sense God has blessed in my heart. Because that is all I need to do. Christ in me is my greatest identity marker. It's my sense of worth. And for that reason, anything in excess. Secondly, the prerequisite of self-effacement, humility. It is said and rightly so that modesty is the offspring of humility. It is lack of humility or character or a character issue or an aspect of inner beauty that Paul decries. I actually think that Paul's problem was not that these women dressed the way they did. His bigger problem was that their inside was not as glamorous as their outside. And he was saying, look, if only they would have a character that brings out humility, the pride of display that is going on here is not necessary, is not, is not going to work. Challenge them to focus on inner beauty, and when they are settled within their inner beauty, the right character, the expression of their outward life will be with moderation. There will be no need for excesses. He was telling young men in our generation that practice your life with character and integrity and, and just live right and you will not need to fake photos on Facebook posts. Oh, how I have met wonderful sisters and brothers who go on a spending spree to be made up, but I don't quite like that word makeup. Not not what it achieves, but the word makeup. Why should you be made up again? You are sufficient <laughs> the way you are. So 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 well it is a common word so let let's it, let me have it. Let me let me leave it for you. So no, no, no quoting me about not liking makeup. Uh, just forget that I said it. But, but think about it. 
The reason people do make up is because there is need to make it better. And it's okay. My wife does it. She doesn't do the... Actually, the only day I saw my wife on makeup and the last day I saw her in it, maybe that's why I behave like this, is when on our wedding day. And I had to use a lot of energy to, to remove that spread over her face after the wedding. Because I helped, you know, to remove it. And she does natural whatever. But occasionally she, she applies nice things on her lips. She applies... <laughs> That is called makeup. <laughs> Just that I don't want to accept it. <laughs> Be that as it may, Paul seems to be saying when the inner is content, is formed, is in order, when character, virtue, when when purity, when when humility, when brokenness, when servitude, when when passion for God is, is, is well anchored on the inside, we have less struggle <coughs> trying to focus excessively on the outside. We have less struggle trying to, to indulge in excess. And I'll be talking about that in a short while under self-control. We have less struggle trying to depict an image of what there is it, humility, a character within. Modesty is a behavior that flows out of remembering our true place of service. Now this is how modesty connects with humility. When you have a humble heart, full of love, seeking to serve others, then you ask whether whatever you are doing in excess is serving the best of others. When you do anything in excess, in most cases, you are focusing on yourself. How will they see me? How will they perceive me? This reminds me again, I have, I have fond memories of J.K. Ewart. This reminds me again of a certain guy who came. Uh, he wasn't too schooled, but he thought that he was going to marry us with some English. <laughs> You know, the guy spoke a lot of nonsense in very big terms on this pulpit. I was the seal chairman. And so, and so uh, the course of the sermon, there was used to be a very radical brother. He used to sit somewhere at that corner. Brother, where your corner? Man, <laughs> and so he texted me and said, Man of God, are you designing Christ or the preacher? In other words, is what that gentleman presenting to us himself or the message of Christ? Now, humility predisposes itself to love and service. It's a function of love and service. So you, 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 you refrain yourself from exerting yourself, not for your own sake. You, you are never humble for your own sake. You are always humble for others' sake. Otherwise, it will not make sense. You are humble before God, you are humble before people. And that humility is not a creation of uh, you know, a state that you create. It's a disposition of the heart that naturally renders you to serve. So when your disposition is to serve other people, to to reduce so that others may increase, both God and other people, then what it does is that you avoid any excesses that would undermine your ability to serve people. So that modesty unfolds, it becomes a fruit, so that it is your disposition to do good for others, anchored on love and humility, that makes you do things with moderation, that makes you you know, it's possible to even sing and lead worship in excess. It's even possible to pray for a show. I remember one time, there used to be brothers in this campus during my time, we used to call them the spiritual arrogant men. <laughs> Spiritually arrogant. Because they would wake up at 3 a.m., come and pray, and then the spiritual chairman would wake up at 5. So as I walk to the place to pray, they would say, now you see, you see, they wait until you clear the demons for them to come and enjoy us. <laughs> <laughs> and 
remember one of them in an AGM seated there. He wrote me a text and said, Man of God, do you know I'm more spiritual than you are? <laughs> and I wrote to him and said, Thank God you have a spiritometer, I know that. Right? <laughs> this is the point. When we are consumed by even the very acts that are meant to serve others, when we come to pray, and the essence and the anchor of a prayer is broke, is bored or anchored on a desire for the good of the chairman, you celebrate when he arrives at five. Because you are saying, oh, how I've prayed for this man. Thank God he has arrived to pray, even himself. You don't say, look, we have prayed for five hours, he can only afford 30 minutes. <laughs> Modesty requires that even when you have excelled and succeeded and are thriving and are better than all the other around you, you have the humility to let them thrive and shine and succeed. It draws you to serve others. Do nothing out of self-ambition, con con Paul would write in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only on your interests, but also on the interests of others. When we strive to become more like Christ, the pinnacle of modesty, expressed in a self-effacing behavior, which is captured in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, of Christ, how great he was, how much power he had, but he stripped himself of all these things in humility and lived a modest, simple, rather poor life, so that we may enjoy riches and greatness. Someone has written, there was no fuss over his physical appearance. He laid down his life for those less important than him. He was submissive as a lamb to slaughter and expressed only what his father instructed him. I sometimes imagine if I was just... Anyone of you who has watched the movie, uh, the name has disappeared. It's called... It's about this guy who, is, who prays that God makes him God. <laughs> Bruce the Almighty. Anyone who has watched Bruce the Almighty? I sometimes think if I was God, I would be worse than Bruce the Almighty. <laughs> but, but Christ had all his powers and the way he lived in humility, in brokenness, in servitude on earth is the pinnacle of a modest life. With humility and modesty, we thrive in serving the needs of others and asking Jesus to take center stage. We stop fighting for social status and for prefer no, preferable, prefer preferential treatment. And we are liberated from the cravings of approval and praise. Maybe I'm the only sinner in this house. You know when you have done that nice thing and it has come out so well and you, you know you did it and you did it super well and everybody can sense and you can feel in the environment that it is gone well, then nobody, nobody cares to tell you how good it was. <laughs> Absolutely nobody. You know moderation tells you, look, not for praise, not for approval, because inside your heart, so humble, but you just need the good of others. And as Jesus told us, you also, when you have done everything you are to do in Luke chapter 17, verse 10, you are told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done our duty. That attitude, that stature of heart is what brings out the offspring of modesty. Number three, as we try to close, self-control as a catalyst for modesty. Self-control expressed as a virtue of modesty in dressing and in other aspects of life is much more worthwhile than religious rules of do's, do's and don'ts. For you to stop from applying from, from from doing things in excess, from parting too much, from applying excessive makeup, from dressing in a strange way. Actually, I recently met a brother. This is, this is a sad story. So, so 
Not good, but an admirer. Not minister. He's doing amazing work in high school ministry. But, but his, his brother is constantly in undersized clothes. The coat is hugging him tight. The trouser is hugging him tight. So I keep asking, man, what's your problem? Then he tells me, he wants to look unique. <laughs> Because it reminded me of our good words during our campus days. But I thought to myself, really? There's a deeper problem with him that we are sorting out. But when self-control gives you the capacity to stop, when you feel you want to look unique, you ask another question, does it honor God? When you still want to watch a little more movies, Moderation, self-control tells you, hey, no. And the grace of God that brings salvation is available for all of us. And that grace teaches us to say no. To say no to excesses. To say no to under performance. To say no to pride. To say no to whatever else will push us. Now, modesty is not just an expression of self-control. It fosters self-control. This brother in his tight trousers, sometimes so indecent, does not recognize that his indecent dressing shifts people, people's focus from whatever good things he would be having and ministry he would be doing to himself and how he's dressed. A couple of years ago, as a STEM staff in Moi Main, I met a friend of mine in a service, after Sunday service. He knew that I related very closely to a certain sister. So he sent me and said, brother, please go and talk to sister so and so. She needs to help us concentrate in worship. The way she, saw, she shows up in church, I must be honest. I concentrate more on her than on the God I came to worship. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what if this sister exercise self-control? He helps this brother exercise self-control. And the two people exercising self-control stars purity, holiness, and reduces excesses of wrong behavior in the body of Christ. So self-control is not as an expression of of self-control, sorry, modesty is not just an expression of self-control, it fosters self-control. When we do things in moderation, we help people to stop fighting other things that will attract them to. We cease being our attraction and hindering healthy fellowship and worship. So people are distracted and therefore we help them too to exercise self-control. But fourthly, simplicity. In a world consumed by pressure to be famous, powerful and wealthy, the quest for simplicity as an expression of modesty is huge. Like women of Ephesus, these things can consume us and drive us to want to show overuse or get over involved in them. Both people who have many possessions as well as those who have few can be possessed by what they have or don't have. The focus of simple lifestyle therefore should be getting rid you should not you be not getting rid of what you have, but rather cultivating a disposition of just enough of what I need. You know, you can be poor but extravagant, but you can also be rich and live a simple life. Fame, wealth, and money or power do not make us content. They only and they don't bring satisfaction. When you don't exercise simplicity and therefore moderation, you are always striving for the next level of excess. When you have dressed in red, glamouring, shouting red, just an example, red is a great color. I'm just using that as an example. Maybe I should use my color now. I have a problem with knowing what colors I have. So let me use my blue, it's more familiar, my black. When you are dressed in black trousers, <laughs> that has silvery, shiny things. And people notice. When they notice today, they notice tomorrow. The following day, it becomes normal. So I'll have to do more. 
for them to keep noticing me. If you don't exercise moderation, there will be no end to your excesses. Simplicity helps you to enjoy life with the basics. Tell your neighbor, enjoy life with the basics. Lack of modesty, modesty, therefore, or simplicity, shifts our focus from God to us and to things. It is destructive and consequently destructive. But simplicity should not be taken as a religious requirement, but rather as an attitude, as a disposition of the heart, as a commitment for the quest to be more generous, to serve, to share, to multiply to live simply, and in the sense, in the commitment to simple lifestyle, exercise a life of moderation. A lot can be said, but time is in ours for now. Let me conclude. We have said that a true sense of self-worth, which is anchored on our identity in Christ, and character of Christ-likeness reflects our true value. Our identity in Christ and our character reflects our true value. Let us consider this as the greatest sense of markers of our self-worth. And if we do, we will not struggle to be modest. But number two, modesty is a fruit of humility. A behavior that flows out of remembering our true place in the body of Christ and wanting to serve others. And therefore we do things in moderation so that others will be edified. Fourthly, thirdly, modesty is not just an expression of self-control. It fosters self-control. And lastly, lack of modesty shifts focus from God to us and things. And this and easily destroy us. The challenge is, in this new semester, in the remaining part of our lives, what if you thought about whether what you're doing is the basic you need? You need to look beautiful. We have no argument. You need to look handsome. There is no question. But must it go to that excess? You know, when we were young, we used to even exaggerate our walking style. You didn't realize that the more we exaggerated, the more we looked like lamb. <laughs> Have you seen people, I think your generation does not do that, but our days looking nice before a girl was to, and you will do that this until you. <laughs> it has no end. If you don't practice modesty, you have no end to excesses. Only Christ will save you. May the grace of God upon our lives drive us for no excesses, but to pursue simplicity, to embrace self-control, to be humble, and to have a right sense of self-worth, so that at all times we will do everything with moderation for the glory of God and for the edification of those around us, and focus on what really matters, our place in God. Let us pray. Father Lord, we bow to you with thanksgiving tonight for the gift of salvation, the gift of life, the privilege of being together in fellowship. Oh, how easy to talk about these things, Lord. How easy to talk about control, how easy to talk about moderation. Yet, we have to fight on because the world around us continually presses us to even lie in interviews, to exaggerate in our CVs. Oh God. How we spend hours trying to change clothes and put off, put on and put off, just consumed by the desire to be appreciated, to be recognized. Oh God, that our cry and desire is that you recognize us by our character, by our virtue, by our values. Lord, I pray 
that will deal in us something different than what the world. And when the world shows off what they have, oh God, we will show the Christ in us that they may see you and glorify your name. So your word says, let the light in you so shine ever brightly. Let your works before men signify your greatness. That they will look at us and rejoice and glorify your name. I pray that you give us self-control. Oh, Spirit of the living God, will you work in us the fruit of self-control, the fruit of humility. In the name of Jesus, that we will rise up and experience your grace. Lord, I thank you. I give you praise. And exalt you. I don't know whether there is anyone among us who has struggled with impressing, making, going to excesses, lost a sense of identity, and you put your identity in other things. God is calling you today to let your identity be. So that you can exercise self-control, humility, and simplicity for his glory. Modesty is a virtue that will help us serve each other in this fellowship and thrive wherever God takes us. So Lord, we submit ourselves to you, recognizing our weaknesses and ability to go to excesses. Let this grace that teaches us to say no. And teach us to exercise restraint, to exercise control, soberness. In the name of Jesus, we praise your name. Holy said and die. Yeah, yeah. We can in brokenness and service shout and declare, not to us, not to us, but to you be the glory now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.